What's going on, everybody? Welcome into the Monday, September 16th, 2024 edition of the Daily Energy Newsbeat Stand-Up. Here are today's top headlines. First up, why Kamala Harris would be a total disaster for American energy sticking on the politics thing. Next up, Kamala dodges on fracking debate, sparking doubt among energy experts. Next up, we'll go abroad. Germany's green gamble, how nuclear power could have saved billions and slashed emissions. Interesting. Next up, some red meat for me. Offshore wind decimating sea life. Fishermen accused Biden-Harris administration of covering it up. Next up, a nice opinion piece from, from Stu. We got a little internal article. <laughs> Bull oil market on the horizon. We will then, he will then toss it over to me. I will quickly cover what happened in the oil and gas markets and talk a little bit about Oxy subsidiary 1.5, getting themselves a nice little government subsidy. So we will cover all that. I got chips, guys. As always, I am Michael Tanner, joined by Stuart Turley. Where do you want to begin? Hey, let's start with our first story here. Why Kamala Harris would be a total disaster for American energy. And Michael, let me tease this story up with a line in here out of the story. This story is out of the Daily Caller. And people don't understand that in 2019, in 2019, building on the incredible innovations of the shale revolution and the pro-energy policies of the Trump administration, the United States became the net energy exporter for the first time in nearly 70 years. At the same time, the country had the largest net reduction of energy-related carbon dioxide, CO2 emissions in the world throughout the Trump administration. The United States also reduced air pollution by 7%. You can have your energy and you can clean the air and you can do it together. The reason that I like this article is because I agree that it is going to be a disaster for the consumer for American energy policies. Yeah, I think this headline is a little bit deceiving. If I were to write this headline, I would say why Kamala Harris would be a total energy disaster for the American energy consumer because well, i do think what's going to happen is oil prices are going to maybe not go to 150 dollars. i think that's a little bit of you know look yeah, at me I over don't... here i'm i'm being crazy but i do think you're going to consistently 80 to 95 dollar oil and that from a consumer standpoint it's not going to help out inflation you're going to see higher prices at the grocery store exactly contrary to what people think higher prices at the grocery store have a lot to do with the transportation costs of getting that food from one place or the other it's not just the inputs going into the food itself it's actually it's getting diesel. it to the grocery store. You'll also see extremely higher prices at the pump. I was driving around today, $2.50 gas. Now, right. that's the that has more to do with some of the refinery stuff. It's also partly due to what we've seen in the last week with oil prices. So, you know, one thing you'll never hear out of these, you know, oil executives sitting over there in Midland, you know, at the Houston Petroleum Club or up here at the Dallas Petroleum Club, they will never tell you that secretly they would love nothing more than $95 oil. Now, they would probably come out and say, well, that just means our cost of services are going to go up. Our margins aren't going to necessarily stay the same. I call baloney. I think secretly they're all sitting there like, hey, if Trump wins, we're probably going to have less regulation. We're probably hopefully going to see, you know, service costs go down because inflation will come down a little bit. And that's what's really hurting our margins. But if Kamala wins, we'll see higher prices and continue to make our nice margins. So I think, ironically, the e &P companies think they're in a win-win. Now, you can't just look at it. That's a very... As I said in the intro, Stu, that's a pretty selfish look if you're an EMP operator. But what do you, as an as a CEO of an enter as an oil and gas okay. company, it's your job to that's your only focus and is if on I was an sure EMP you make a lot of money. So I, I think I, from a consumer standpoint, it's it's going to hurt tremendously. There's going to be pain at the pump. You're going to see higher prices, restrictive oil and gas. It's it's going to be really tough. You bet. Hey, let's go to the next one here. Kamala dodges fracking at debate, sparking the doubts among energy experts. Michael, I started this several weeks ago to frack or not. And I asked Grok X on Grok to create a picture of Kamala Harris in a Shakespearean role. And she's got a sign that says to frack or not. 
That is the question. I, I got tickled at that. But let's take a look at this. Demand is what tr largely triggers, triggers production. I think people forget that including the vice president to the energy director explained the reason why the vice president is touting Biden increasing production and keeping afloat is because there are checks and balances and other actions you see from the regular to regulatory side they actually cut the they banned fracking and cut the production capability through their regulatory processes and i i don't think that they're going to be very good for oil well i again i think it's how you frame it they're going to be great for oil prices and so if you are a fan of higher oil prices you have to you, you're really yep. conflicted because it's going to be terrible on the consumer. I don't think any doubt. We don't know where she stands on fracking because it's clear in 2019, she specifically said she was going to ban fracking. Then she said in the debate, she's not going to ban fracking. I'm okay with people changing their mind. This is where I, I do find it a little bit crazy when everybody, I Stu, let me finish. Okay? okay. I find it a little bit annoying when someone says, Oh, well he changed his mind or she changed his mind. It's like, well, I change my mind all the time. I actually enjoy changing my mind because it means I learned something and now I'm less wrong tomorrow than I was yesterday. So if you're changing your mind based on the facts and admit you're changing your mind, that's totally okay with me. And if she had just come out and said, hey, man, I was against fracking. I'll be honest. I was against it. But I got an office. I saw how continued oil and gas production actually helps consumers. And now I've decided that I'm against fracking. I'd actually be okay with it. But that's clearly not what she's doing here. It's most likely a political sa political position that she's taking now, which means the waters are extremely muddy when it comes to what she'd actually do. Right. An example. She said, don't, why are you making these lies about whether or not I'm going to pick the guns up? And she says, Waltz and I are gun owners. And then two days later, she puts out on her own Twitter feed and says, I'm going to pick up the guns. No, she I, is I, going to ban fracking. I agree. I think I think the problem with, you know, the the ex accounts is she's not running them. It's some 22 year old who just graduated from college who they give the social media. It's, you know, the classic social media intern who just got the credentials. So, yes, I agree with you. It, you, you can't believe a word she says because she's not being honest about her flip flopping. If you're just honest about changing your mind or quote unquote flopping, I'm OK with that because that means you're less wrong today than you were yesterday. I agree. You and I are on the same page, but I don't believe anything that anything from a government is going to tell me right now. Oh, absolutely. And that, that <laughs> such a point here is the government never says that. They just say, well, I've always believed this. It's like, well, no, we're not stupid. <laughs> Traditional gaslight. Yeah. Hey, let's go over to Germany. Green energy gamble. How nuclear could have saved billions slashed emissions. Let me tell you this one right in here, right in this article. This article is from Breitbart. Let's take a look. In a declassified document produced just months before the Russian invasion revealed that the Merkel government, which at the time included Chancellor Olaf Scholz, believed that increasing Germany's reliance on gas from Russia through the Nord Stream pipeline would not jeopardize the secure energy of supplies to Germany and the EU. Ooh, ooh, that was wrong. But by over and large, the by if additionally, if Germany had invested further in nuclear in 2002, it would have seen emissions fall by 73 percent, nearly three times the current rate, while still saving 300 billion euros. 321 compared to the green in the year agenda. They just lost a ton of money in national security by their energy policies. And Germany is generally considered the manufacturing hub, the high manufacturing hub of the EU. I mean, you talk about some, you know, ball bearings. You talk about all of the really precision manufacturing that goes on. German engineering used to be a thing. It's, it was German engineered. It was great. It was yep. always considered world class. And the, the, Problem with manufacturing is that it's energy intensive. Same and so as you create higher energy costs, it not only just costs you more from an energy standpoint, if you're trying to turn on your lights, it also drives heavy industry out of your country because they need to at least make a problem. I mean, that's, you know, we live in a capitalist society. In order to encourage people to do things, you have to provide them an opportunity to make a profit. If you don't want to provide people the opportunity to make a profit, you're a communist. It's as simple as that. Yep. Absolutely. I liked it. And I thought this was a great one. Shout out to Brett Bart. Yes. All right.
Hey, let's go to your favorite topic here. Offshore wind decimating sea life. Fishermen accuse Biden Heron of cover up. Got to give a shout out to our buddy there, Michael Schellenberger. Love him. Why now? In part because of the recent collapse of a giant wind turbine, which I covered with David Blackman, Irina Slav, and Tammy Nemeth on the energy reality off the coast of Massachusetts, which scattered jagged pieces of fiberglass Take a moment. This video is an outstanding video. When the offshore wind developers came commercial, they're now not able to find lobster. They're not finding fish. They're not finding all of these things. But Michael, I did not know until I started getting into this and following Michael Schellenberg. The microplastics, how much wind farm material actually gets into the fish. It's not just the dead whales. And I, I know that you don't mind a dead whale or two, but it's actually all of the fish and the microplastics is huge. Well, we've decimated our, our fish population, not necessarily from the wind farm, but just from overconsumption, overfishing, all that stuff. Yeah, I mean, it's it, it's clear I'm no fan of the whales, and this might be the one positive byproduct of offshore wind. The microplastics, I think, are interesting, though, from the standpoint of, you know, that's something everybody can agree on. I, I read some stat yep. the other day. We eat a credit card's worth, like a credit card thin and wide worth right. of plastics every single year. And I mean, think about it. everything you buy comes in plastics. And right. you know, a lot of the food you eat is directly sourced from that. I think it's interesting. There's a great graph. I don't, it's not on it's it's in the source article. It's not necessarily in here, but they show a graph of the whale population i mean it's completely crashing that slope is massively downward we lost eight last year the you know down from 348 to 340 the lifespan of these whales are going down thank goodness again but i, I think it's interesting that the fishermen who generally you would consider clearly as environmentalists are trying to bring this to the attention of anybody who will listen and the, the, nobody will listen only when it's politically convenient do people care about the environment. I think that's the overarching thing to remember here is that it's only politically convenient to talk about the environment when it favors you. When it doesn't, mouth shut. And I, and I, and I just really am, am tired of it's about pollution and energy poverty. If you married good policies to end energy poverty with the environment, we would have low cost energy. Oh, All right. We would. We absolutely would. Let's go to the last one here. This was an article. I see a bull market on the horizon, and there's two reasons why. This is from me, Stuart Turley, a legend in my own mind, Michael. So when we sit back and take a look, years ago when I worked at Intel, Moore's Law states that for every two years, the number of transistors will double in the transistors. And that has not been proven wrong yet. Moore's Law. There is another side of this is why I think that we're in a not going to see an energy transition and that there is a bull market for we are seeing the failure of the EV market. And everybody is out there saying, oh, wait, the EV and the gasoline demand and the, and the diesel demand is going to go down and we're going to have all these EVs. There are EVs going everywhere that are failing the uk just announced that they're going to have to go to hybrids and they're really they're really going to extend the hybrids and allow them to continue on so that we are seeing some fight back on this oh we're absolutely seeing some fight back on this i think this is yeah. a great article we're probably going to include some of this in an ebook that we're going to release here soon i think the one thing you point out is we need all forms of energy the difference right. is we live in a capitalist society so people are going to gravitate towards not only the most cost effective we're, they're going to navigate towards the most cost effective source and the cost isn't necessarily the price cost is efficiency cost right. is how easy it is to get you know if it takes you two hours to charge your EV car and you're only saving a penny per gallon of electricity, people are going to use that because your time is worth more than that. So cost involves a lot more than just, oh, what's the actual physical price? I love that first question you asked. Will oil, is oil going to fade away as we near quote unquote 
peak oil. I mean, I think it's pretty obvious. Every year, people have tried peak oil. Oh, peak oil's just around the corner, just around the corner, and they keep revising it. So, obviously, eventually, there will come a time when we will probably reach peak oil. I mean, it I will agree. Happen at some point, it, maybe it won't. I mean, that's the other the other argument is that we'll never reach peak oil because prices will continue to rise to the point where uneconomic oil becomes economic. I, you know, people always ask me, well. Well, are we going to run out of oil? It's like, well, maybe, but not really, because it's not a matter of we don't know where oil is. We know where a lot of oil is. The question is, is it economic to go get it? And will the government allow you to go get it? I mean, there's a lot of right. stuff in, in China. They're they're drilling as much as they can, but we got all the stuff in the Arctic. we got much more off the coast in, in, in Gulf of Mexico. So it's going to be very interesting. Love this article. Highly recommend checking out our ebook, and it'll have a lot more of this kind of stated. Nice. Out. Cool. Well done. All right, well, let's go ahead and jump over, do a quick finance wrap-up. Before we do that, guys, we got to pay the bills. As always, the news and quote-unquote analysis you just heard is brought to you by the world's greatest website, EnergyNewsBeat.com, the best place for all your energy and oil and gas news. Stu and the team do a tremendous job making sure that website stays up to speed. Everything you need to know to be at the tip of the spear when it comes to the energy and the oil and gas business. Go ahead and hit that description below. All of the links to the timestamps, links to the articles. Check us out on Substack, theenergynewsbeat.substack.com. And uh, you can also check out investinoil.energynewsbeat.com for our exclusive direct working interest opportunity that we are partnering up with the team at Pecos Country Operating and Ray Trevino, great, great friend of the show. Go ahead and do that, guys. Again, that's investinoil.energynewsbeat.com. I mean, pretty, pretty wild Friday, Stu. Not much going on. We only saw about a half a percentage point rise on the, uh, on the S&P 500. NASDAQ was up about four tenths of a percentage point, two year yields down about 1.6 percentage points. 10 year yields were actually down about six tenths of a percentage point. We see Bitcoin still trading right just below 60,000, 59.8 and about $800. Crude oil kind of tumbled mainly due to the fact that a lot of that Gulf of Mexico production was coming back online. It was down to 68.65. As it looks to open here as we record this mid afternoon here on the 15th, markets will open here in a bit. Looks to open probably somewhere a little above $69, but currently market close somewhere around $68.65. Brent oil down to $72.21. Natural gas down two percentage points after reaching highs up at $2.40. We're down about two percentage points, $2.35. The XOP contract on Friday raised about 1.02 percentage points. That's hundred up to $128.55. I mean, Stu, what are you seeing in the oil markets? I know we just talked about this, but from a from a short term pricing standpoint, you were talking about something during the intro. Are you you're seeing some market manipulation going on? You think? Yes, I think we're going to stay around that seventy five to eighty five range. We know that OPEC needs ninety to eighty five to ninety really to meet their needs. So I I really think you're, it's a safe bet in that area. Yeah. Another interesting note: we saw U.S. oil and gas rig counts drop on Friday, plus eight. So pretty large movement week over week relative to what we've been seeing. Still 51 rigs south of what it was at this same time last year. But, you know, something, you know, obviously picking up rigs is a is a lagging indicator per se. It's not necessarily because of what happened last week, but some of the stuff that's been happening over the past couple weeks. It was interesting to note that we did see Coterra Energy CEO Tom Jordan, shout out Colorado School of Mines alumni. He said that they are actually dropping their last Marcellus rig in order to kind of balance out what's going on with natural wow. gas prices. So super interesting there. You know, the only other thing I saw, Stu, here we go. 1.5, which is an Oxy subsidiary, their South Texas direct air capture hub awarded U.S. Department of Energy funding. And so I'll just read some, read straight from the release here. 1.5, a wholly owned subsidiary of Occidental, announced on Friday that the U.S. Department of Energy's Office of Clean Energy Demonstrations, what a weird name, will provide up to, get this number, Stu, five. Hundred million dollars to support the development of South Texas direct air capture. This award is a milestone further and further, blah, 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 blah. The funding will be provided in multiple tranches. The initial award of $50 million will advance 1.5's ongoing work currently at that DAC hub. Upcoming activities include engineering, permitting, 
and procurement of long lead equipment and continued community engagement. That's just a whatever. To further 1.5's community benefits plan. I want to get in on a $50 million community benefits plan. That's where your, that's where your hard-earned tax dollars is going, guys. The total award value for the South Texas DAC hub is expected to be up to $500 million and potentially increase increased up to $650 million for the development of an expanded regional network in South Texas. And now, folks, you see why Warren Buffett loves Oxy. He doesn't love it. He likes the oil and gas, but he loves this stuff. He loves free money. He loves it when the government loans his company's money. That's why he bought banks after 2008, because guess what? He knew they were going to get a lot of tart money. He loves oil and gas companies that are trying to go out and get literally $650 million free dollars from the U.S. taxpayer to do direct air capture, which we don't, I don't even need to debate direct air capture. Who knows if it'll work or not? The fact that we are subsidizing this as a country to the tune of $650 million, to the tune of Oxy, who should have this money lying around, what this tells me, it ain't economic. It just blows my mind, Stu. Blows my mind. It is absolutely ludicrous. I mean, this is what I've been saying for for a while. You know, people say, "Well, why is or or you know, you know, Warren Buffett, Berkshire, they're all in on energy. They're all in on energy. Well, then why are they on Oxy? Why are they investing in Oxy? There are better oil and gas companies. Yeah, there are better oil and gas companies to invest but in. They're right here, baby. Right here. There's six hundred and fifty million dollar <laughs> free reasons why he wants in on this. Yes, yep. I read this article and I said, "Oh." It's it's they're just saying it without saying it. Right. I mean, you do you agree with me with that oh. th- that analysis. Oh, I agree. Three hundred percent. Well, hey, there you go, folks. I got three hundred percent agreement from Stu. If only we could agree on the whales. If only we could get an agreement on the whales. We Stu, won't. That's all I've got. What should people be worried about this week? Let's be Here's praying for President Trump. They just had shots fired at his golf course with an AK-47 found in the bushes. I don't know any other details other than that. So shots fired around the president, the former president. He's I haven't heard if he shot or not, but let's we keep praying for him. Right. We don't, don't want anybody. I don't, to, I don't see it on Twitter yet. I do. Well, good. That's why well, you're on a you're on a crazy side of Twitter. I'll give you that much. Thank you. That's in a good way. In a, in a good way. Yeah. Everyone needs to follow Stu on X if you really want to scare yourself. Unfortunately, I talk to people from all over the world, and that's the sad part. No, you 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 get it there. Well, all right. We got we had some, recorded some great interviews last week. We're gonna have some great stuff coming up this week, guys. So buckle up. I will be out of the chair Wednesday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. So you're gonna hear a show with us tomorrow, and then Stu's gonna wrap the week up for us. So I apologize in advance, but he'll do a great job holding the fort down, guys. As always, thank you for checking us out on the world's greatest podcast and website, Energy News Beat for Stuart Turley. I'm Michael Tanner. We'll see you tomorrow, folks. See you.